Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to Riggs Library for our latest conversation in our series on faith and culture. And we're deeply grateful to be joined today by our 22nd U.S. Poet Laureate, Tracy K. Smith. And Tracy, we want to thank you for being with us. It's wonderful to have you here at Georgetown just one month into your new role, and we look forward to your reflections this afternoon. I also wish to extend a special welcome to Bishop Paul Tai, the Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture, and it's an honor to have you back with us, Your Excellency. Now, over the course of the past several years, as part of our ongoing partnership, we've been privileged to host a number of events on our campus with the Pontifical Council for Culture, including a three-day gathering this past, the, um, a three-day gathering called Courtyard of the Gentiles, Faith, Culture, and the Common Good in 2014. And then just this past spring, we had a conference towards a new economy, justice, culture, and the social market. So Your Excellency, thank you for your extraordinary leadership in promoting dialogue and reflection on faith and culture and for your presence here this afternoon. And we're also deeply grateful to be joined by Paul Eli, the senior, senior fellow at our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, director of our American Pilgrimage Project and curator of our Faith and Culture series here at Georgetown. Through this series, now spanning nine years, We've had the privilege of welcoming a number of distinguished authors and artists to the hilltop from Alice McDermott and Richard Rodriguez to Marilyn Robinson and Colin McCann. In recent years, we've welcomed Christian Wyman and Billy Collins. Just last semester, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie was here, as was Martin Scorsese. So this afternoon, we're deeply grateful to have the opportunity to include Tracy K. Smith as part of this series. Today, the author of three collected works of poetry, the recipient of a Pulitzer Prize for her, her 2011 collection, and a writer of a memoir that was recognized as a finalist for the National Book Award, Tracy has demonstrated an interest and talent in writing and poetry from an early age, describing in her memoir a formative encounter with Emily Dickinson as a fifth grader. Growing up in Northern California, the youngest of five children in a military family, she came to the East Coast to earn her bachelor's degree from Harvard University in English and, and American Literature and African American Studies. In 1997, she received her Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from Columbia University but before being recognized with the Stegner Fellowship in Poetry at Stanford. Earlier this year, when she was selected as Poet Laureate, she was serving as the Roger S. Berlind Pro Professor in the Humanities and Director of the Creating Creative Writing Program at Princeton. Her debut collection of poetry, The Body's Question, received the 2002 Cave Canham Poetry Prize, and her second collection, Duende, earned the Academy of American Poets 2006 James Laughlin Award. She was awarded the 2012 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry for her collection, Life on Mars, which centers on the legacy of her late father, an engineer who worked on the Hubble telescope. And her memory, which she just wrote two years later, Ordinary Light, which came out in 2015, is very much an elegy to her late mother and one of the many ways throughout her career that she has reflected on the meaning of family, memory, faith, and loss. Next year, she will publish her fourth volume of poetry, Wade in the Water. In addition to exploring her personal experiences, her, work, her works provide an opportunity for us to reflect on race and identity, to realize ideas of faith and salvation, and to consider what it means to be American and how we might envision and enact a better future. In the words of our Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, Tracy's quote, Tracy's work travels the world and takes on its voices, brings history and memory to life, calls on the power of literature as well as science, religion, and pop culture, close quote. And presenting many voices and points of view and bringing the past into the present, 
Poetry is an invitation to empathy and understanding. As Tracy reminds us, quote, poems cause a person to slow down, to look and listen more carefully, and to submit to the validity of other voices, other perspectives, other kinds of truth. Poetry as an art form gives us practice, caring about others, and accepting that their perspectives can be as valid and vital as our own. Close quote. This is what brings us together today and why we are so honored and privileged to have Tracy with us to share her insights and the joy and empathy that an engagement with writing and language can evoke. And there's no better partner for Tracy in this conversation on faith and culture than distinguished author, editor, member of our community, Paul Eli. Before joining Georgetown, Paul spent nearly two decades in publishing as a senior editor with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. He's the author of two books, The Life You Save May Be Your Own and Reinventing Bach, as well as essays and articles for The Atlantic and The New York Times, Vanity Fair, and Commonweal. Through his writing, his projects at the Berkeley Center, his leadership of this faith and culture lecture series, Paul explores religious beliefs and narratives and invites us to observe, examine, and understand the place of faith in contemporary society. We are grateful to have him with us as moderator today, and now it's my privilege to welcome into conversation our participants today, Tracy K. Smith and Paul Eli. Thank you very much, President DeJoya. Welcome back, Bishop Tai, and welcome back uh, to you too, Tracy K. Smith. We're really honored that you're here and so glad uh, to be doing this today. Your poet laureate, uh, your life was already very full and now it's, it's crammed to bursting. It's a good thing you got that new book of poems done. <laughs> uh, when you came today, uh, and this is the sign of a real artist, she said, I, I would like to read new work. So could you uh, start things off by uh, reading a poem from the forthcoming book? Sure. Um, it's, it's on. OK. There's always a moment when somebody has to ask. So I'll just take the hit, and I'll ask, <laughs> is it on? Um, I'll read the title poem to uh, my new book, which is called Life, I'm, Life on the No, Wade in the Water. Um, and I'll just tell you a little tiny bit about the book. Um, I've become really interested in thinking more deeply about compassion. I was going to say love. This is a book that's, that's desperate for love to feel familiar. I think there are a lot of love, traditional love poems in my first three books. There are none really in this one, but it's a book that's obsessed with what, would it, what it would feel like if I could love you and you and you and um, what our world would, would feel like if that was our, our prime objective, um, which I'm told it is supposed to be. So um, this poem is from, it's kind of anecdotal. I was in uh, coastal Georgia this past winter doing research on uh, Geechee and Gullah communities. Um, these are, you know, areas like islands off of Georgia where people who had been enslaved there were able, because of the geography, to maintain a, a distinct sense of some of the ties to the West African culture um, through language and, and tradition. I went to a performance. My heart was heavy from all of the other history from that area um, that I had been uh, exploring. And I walked into this space, and one of the performers walked up to me and said, I love you. And she gave me a, a hug. And I kind of lost it. Then I heard her saying that to the person behind me and the next person. And um, it didn't diminish it. It felt like such a beautiful gift that someone could give. Um, her name is Bertha McKnight. Wade in the water. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her, and a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest, like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. 
I love you, I love you, as she continued down the hall, past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance in every hand clap, every stomp. I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretended to wade, singing that old blood deep song that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. I love you, the angles of it scraping at each throat, shouldering past the swirling dust motes in those beams of light that whatever we now knew we could let ourselves feel knew to climb. Oh, woods, oh, dogs, oh, tree, oh, gun, oh, girl, run, oh, miraculous many gone, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, is this love the trouble you promised? You're in the room. She's saying, I love you. Uh, does, does that present itself as a, as a, as a poem or a, a, a poetic moment to you? How much of it's there at that moment and how much of it's recollected in tranquility? <laughs> I think most of it, I, I hope, is recollected. I think in that moment, I was just there in, in that space, kind of responding to what her words created. And I, I brought that feeling home with me. And um, she's a member of a group that does ring shouts as a way of keeping this tradition alive. And I was listening to the recording of them. And I couldn't not write about that because I wanted to get back into that space. I wanted to almost testify to that. The word testify has all sorts of religious associations. The blood deep song that is referenced in the poem uh, and whose title it carries is uh, an African-American spiritual. Uh, Fisk Singers, Ramsey Lewis, Nick Cave, PJ Harvey. I worked my way through them this morning. <laughs> uh, what does it mean to, uh, to not only to write a poem with that title, but then to make that the title of your book? It situates the work in relationship to African-American tradition, but also to the Christian tradition, mm -hmm. how exactly, what, what's, what are you doing there? Um, well, I'm asking that book to, I mean, that work, that poem, I'm asking it to be like a beacon of the book. You know, I'm always interested in the dark realities of what it, you know, what it means to be alive, but I'm also really grateful for those other glimmers of something that feels larger than what we're normally capable of. So I wanted that poem to, to occupy that space. Um, as it happens, there is another poem that's thinking about water, literally, in the book that sits at a different register. Um, and it's a, a long poem. There are a lot of found poems we were talking about at lunch in this book. So this is another found poem that's drawn from a, an article that some of you may have seen in the New York Times Magazine about four years ago. Um, about a lawyer who had discovered some chemical dumping, dumping that the DuPont company was doing um, decades ago in Pennsylvania. Um, I knew that was a, an important piece of journalism, and I wanted to find a way of, of thinking about it in a poem. I didn't know how to do that, so I kept that article for years. And more recently, I've been reading a lot of um, narratives of, that come out of people's near-death experiences, which are, they sit often at that beautiful spectrum, uh, end of the spectrum where, you know, people experience a feeling of universal benevolence, um, and they're excited to come back and talk about it. Um, and so those two sources, I wanted to see if I could make them speak together. So there's a poem that, that's bringing these two um, bits of human testimony 
into the same space. Um, and that poem is called Watershed. So I wanted the beauty of the, you know, the ring shout um, to help look more willingly at all this other stuff we're capable of doing as well. So you have love, compassion, universal benevolence, and yet the key line of Wade in the Water, which is uh, brought into the poem, is about the troubling the water. The Lord troubles the waters, and the suggestion, I think, is that the artist troubles the waters, uh, maybe too. Is that um, w what's going on there? Mm -hmm. Well, I, that, yeah. Those last lines of the poem, yeah, I Yeah, is, is this love the trouble you promised? I just wanted to keep listening to that song. And um, I, I, I can't sing, but when I put my kids to bed, during that period, I was putting my, my twin boys to bed, and we would sing, I make them sing that song with me. And um, they would say, come on, wade in the water, guys. <laughs> wade in the water, kids. Because um, they didn't know the, the words. But I, I love that idea that this thing that's being um, believed in is fraught, right? God's going to trouble the waters. Troubling um, as a verb is something that's so fascinating to me because I think it's so necessary. I, I, I use that verb all the time in the classroom. Okay, this needs to be... this sits in the poem in a way that hasn't been mined. Let's trouble it, you know, let's get in there and see what, how it can shock us. Um, and so thinking about love as that force um, that's disruptive um, made sense, especially when I think about so many things that demonstrate that we are willing to defend ourselves against love very aggressively. Um, there's another poem in the book that uh, draws upon that photo from uh, a few summers ago, Unrest in Baton Rouge, um, by the photojournalist Jonathan Bachman. It uh, came out of um, a Black Lives Matter uh, protest where a woman in a beautiful gauzy sundress is standing in the street. The wind is blowing the dress back. She's so unarmed. And there's a line of police officers in riot gear standing her down. And um, you know the visual makeup of that photo tells me there's something that they fear that this woman has and all I can see is kind of peace and love in her bearing and I, I wanted to explore that in literal terms what if love is this thing this blade we think can cut us you know this weapon that that exacts something from us is that poem uh, brief enough that you could read it? Yeah, if I can. Because you, you really got me. Sure. Uh, okay. Why, why okay. did you hear it? Um, okay, Unrest in Baton Rouge is back here. Sorry. I'm we kidding. don't usually come back for second helpings in the series, but <laughs> okay. how can we let the poem not be read after, after the way you just okay. described it? I just have to find. I'm still getting to know the layout of this book, and I haven't numbered the pages properly. Here it is. Um, the woman's name in the photo is um, Aisha Evans. Unrest in Baton Rouge. Our bodies run with ink dark blood. Blood pools in the pavement's seams. Is it strange to say love is a language few practice but all or near all speak. Even the men in black armor, the ones jangling handcuffs and keys, what else are they so buffered against if not love's blade sizing up the heart's familiar meat? We watch and grieve. We sleep, stir, eat, Love, the heart sliced open, gutted, clean. Love, naked almost, in the everlasting street, skirt lifted by a different kind of breeze. <laughs> Snapping there. <laughs> um. Here you are, Poet Laureate. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, putting together work that comments on our time in a way that has the feel of permanence, the poem I, you just read, I mean. 
your memoir leads us through your girlhood to the time really when you started to become a writer. Uh, how did you get from that point to here, this moment of becoming a poet? Uh, can you tell us how that, how you recognize that or how it happened? Uh, yeah. I, um, I was one of those kids that loved language. You know, I loved reading. I liked making little things in language, but I didn't know that was a possibility. I'd never read a book by a living author until probably I left home for college. Um, Who was it? Oh, I, um, I'll tell you soon. I don't remember what that would be. I should know. I I'm just asking because Seamus yeah. Heaney was the one yeah. for me. Well, that, well yeah. he was one of the ones that made me feel like I needed to try and do this thing that he exemplified in his work. Um, maybe he was one of the first because I remember I was taking one of the big survey courses at Harvard and we'd spent, you know, eight, the first semester probably, 18th century, we spent a long time. And I remember finally in the beginning of the spring reading Digging in the Norton Anthology and then saying, oh, wow, this is what I need to do. This is what I wish I had to say. And it's the way I would want to say it. And the sense of, of place and of childhood and of adult vocation that he brings together in that poem. Um, and the fact that it was so, I didn't have to struggle to hear that click that sometimes you have to wait for when you're first learning to read poems. I didn't have to do that. It, it entered me in a way that felt so exhilarating. Um, and that was during my sophomore year at Harvard. Was the Dark Room Collective, did that follow, follow on that experience? Yeah, it was around that same time. I and think it was that same semester that I met um, members of the Dark Room and started going to that reading series. And it was the next year that I started taking poetry workshops. And I think all of that happened because in addition to just feeling, you know, so thrilled by what Heaney was doing in language and with private and public history, I also realized that what poems require you to do is slow down and look really closely at something small. Even if the poem is speaking to something huge, it's looking at these small details. And um, it felt like magic the way that those things could be transformed into other things. And I wanted to find ways of making the world that I knew but was still sort of mystified by um, better and clearer. And so I would write little poems about riding my bike in the city or about um, you know, dancing or imagining my parents as young people. And just in these little tiny things, feeling, OK, I've touched this. I've touched something now. And it's different. And it will always be different. Um, and that just felt so useful to me. It was hard to imagine what else would be that useful. And it still is. So you just described a number of instances. There you are as a college student or graduate student going back to your childhood and finding small things there. Really the big thing back there was religious faith and the language of religious faith. You said church and the language of religion were non-negotiable in your household. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a um, Baptist devotion that if, if it permeates permeated your life the way it permeates your account of your life. It must have been very strong. How was the act of becoming a poet a kind of carrying forward of that language or a leave taking of that language or something else? I don't think I thought about it very much either way at that time. I think that initially it was just a, um, an act of meaning making um, but I could also come to recognize in what I was saying about my writing and other people's writing something that felt similar to what, what is said in the church or what is said um, about the, the word of God. Like we talked about our poems in workshop as though they were people, you know, your poem your poem seems to be trying to, you know, your poem keeps coming back to this. Why are you doing all this stuff to subvert that? Let's stop doing that and let's see what the poem is, is trying to say here. And um, you know, that other feeling of using my vocabulary, using my 
ability to see and imagine, but also hearing something that wasn't me coming out also felt like it was an invitation to believe that there's something more at work. That's not hard for me to do because I was taught there is a lot more at work and, and you can pray to it. You can, you can have a relationship with that. So that came, that sense of, you know, credulity, I guess, came pretty naturally to me. Um, in reflecting on that time and reflecting on my mother who was going through um, cancer when I was in college and um, I now can see really clearly that there, there's a sense of, of um, there, a parallel between this investment, the kind of faith that I was exercising and saying, I know that this is a poem, I know that there's something that I can make of this feeling um, and what my mother was doing when she was praying, saying, I know, I know your will will be done, whether it's to heal me or something else. Um, I think the, you know, in, in my memoir, I call poetry a version of, you know, the language of the soul. Um, and I still really do feel like that. I don't think that you have to believe in the soul to write poetry. But I know there are a lot of things that po writers of poems say about the mysterious aspects of what they do. Um, an easy thing to do is to liken it to the unconscious mind, which I do often as well. Um, the, the part of ourselves that is smarter and sort of probably ageless, and that is thinking in, in associations and perception, you know, unwitting perceptions and dream syntax, um, that's, you know, that, that's also scientific. We, can, we know that's there. Uh, but then there are, other, there are other aspects of creative practice that do sometimes feel like a spiritual practice. So when you mention it, it's not really the language of the, the Bible or the parables from the Gospels or the letters of St. Paul. It's this language of the spirit in a more general way. And yet, one of the striking things about Ordinary Light is that it's a deeply religious book that's not a churchy book. We don't see your family at church much. The religion is in the home. The sense of faith is very strong, but it's not um, a chapter and verse accounts at all. It left me wondering, can you, what was the texture of religious life like in that community? When we had Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie here, she, she gave us a version of her 14-year-old self trying to convert someone to Catholicism. Oh. You know, what, what did it, what, what did it, what, what was that language of faith that you heard around the house, apart from what you've just described? Uh, it was, well, gracious Lord, we truly thank you for the food we're about to receive. Um, Before every meal. Yeah, it was, oh, I'm scared about this test. Okay, let's pray. Um, and you yeah. would get down with your mother we on just, your knees? or No, we would just sit or stand. Whatever we were doing, we would just close our eyes and say, you know, dear God, please help Tracy to relax about. And so that was... Uh, that was real for me. It still is. You know, I've struggled with faith. You know, what I want to call it, what it means, what group it means I belong to. The writing of my last two books um, particularly enact that. Um, and I think they help me come to a place where I'm willing to say, yes, I need to pray. I pray. I have three kids, and I don't know what this world has in store for them. I pray for them. Like, that's. Um, that that's where all of this has led me, I think. But it's funny, I mean, you, you mentioned the Gospels and everything. I um, think metaphor, I was just talking, I gave a talk about metaphor and I had to think, what do I, what do I believe metaphor really is about? And we know it's descriptive and we know it does great things, but what is it really about? And I think it's really about allowing someone to get to a place where they can experience a paradox something that will allow them to accept that this thing that's supposed to be this way, love, supposed to be this way, it wasn't like that for me. It was like that. And, and I can only describe it by way of this other wrong con context. What else is like that? Oh, well, the parables are kind of like that. All of the work, all of the strange mysteries in Christ's word and words in the Bible are full of crazy metaphor because there's something that he's trying to communicate that can't live in the ordinary relationships between words. And 
for all of the disciples that were so excited about trying to recreate the experience of the miraculous for people who hadn't had direct access to it, language couldn't be pedestrian. Language had to go to that wrong place in order to create some spark, some living spark. So in the sense, to go back to one of the poems you read earlier, love was a language that uh, we all know but don't often enough speak, but then the more arresting uh, figurative language comes in, love as a knife to cut the heart's meat, that that's coming out of the same impulse as uh, some of the more arresting imagery in the Bible. Yeah, you know? I mean, that awful image that made me so scared as a little girl, the wine press, God's wine press at the end of, you know, <laughs> like in six months or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, you know, it's a disruption that is necessary in order to experience something anew. Then to turn it around, you know, Flannery O'Connor spoke about the need for the novelist to make belief believable. And so as someone who thinks about these things, I just look to see when religious language seems particularly credible. And one of the best instances comes um, from Life on Mars. So much of your work is about, and we'll go there, uh, your determination or your wish to honor your father and mother and carry forward what they were you know, in your life and in your work. And this is in reference to your father. And I'm going to focus on the verb. I pray you are what waits to break back into the world through me. So that's a very uh, compact and, and powerful way of putting the daughter's wish to, to be what's best about her father. Uh, I pray you are what waits to break back into the world through me. Yeah. Um, he, he's, he's over there in heaven, or, and you're, he's, you wanted to break back into experience through, through, through you. Yeah, I guess that's what the words say. Um, and I think. <laughs> <laughs> so why do I keep saying it right? Well, you said it perfectly clearly. <laughs> well, I say that because that's, that is what I wrote. And then I also know I wrote that poem while I was pregnant with my first child, and I was also using the joy and the mystery that was joyful um, in that you know, way, like, oh, there's someone inside of me growing, and that person has a personality that I'll come to know. That's all happening. And she's probably connected to this weird system that also takes people away. Um, and so there's a literal tinge to that as well, like, oh, maybe, maybe he can really just come back. Dorothy Day, the Catholic saint, let's call her, she was brought to religion really by the sense of gratitude she felt uh, as a pregnant woman. Uh, she hadn't expected to be able to get, get pregnant, and the gratitude she felt was so large that it could only uh, uh, you'd be, be, be pointed backward towards God, and she began to pray, not unlike, you know, in, in the way that you're describing, and then her career as a social activist and writer followed on that. Now, as a, as a parent, do you think about how to um, communicate these things to the next generation? You're singing Wade in the Water to your sons at bedtime. You're praying uh, to be what's best about your father for your daughter. Um, how, how does it, how is it carried forward? Um, well, it's different. Um, I, I think what I choose to do is shaped by what, it's kind of like the way I teach. I teach in some ways based on the best things that happen in workshops and I just don't want to have anything to do with the hor horrible things that happened in workshops that I was in. <laughs> um, and I feel that way about, you know, instilling a, a religious sense in my kids or making space for it. I want them to have someone they can say, I'm scared to, who's not me, you know. I want them to believe that there is something possible that can't be explained. And I also don't want them to feel that believing that gives them the authority to judge or condemn people who don't believe that or who believe it differently. So the vocabulary is different. Um, 
we're not church going people. Um, I don't know if that will always be true, but I, I that's not what, what we do. Um, but my kids, we pray every night before we go to sleep. Wow. And um, I, I also talk to them about what I'm interested in that I don't understand about life. You know, I talk to them about how I think love is a life-giving force. And it, it's not exactly a scientific statement, but wouldn't it be exciting if what we feel could make things happen? Um, you know, my, my boys are four, so those conversations aren't quite as elaborate. But my, <laughs> <laughs> but my daughter is, is eight, and she's very precocious, and she's very interested in moral questions. Um, she saw Star Wars as a little, little kid and was obsessed with the dark side. <laughs> and so I felt like, oh, wow, okay, let's, right, let's talk about the, whatever the opposite of that is, too, like um, the force. And uh, yeah, I just, I'm, I feel like maybe she's, she's somebody that I can bounce ideas off of as, as they seem useful. And I also want her to know that, and I think she knows this, her vocabulary for things will probably be different from mine. And she'll teach me things in one day, too. One of the things that comes across so clearly, especially in Ordinary Light, your prose memoir, is just what good people your parents were. Marilyn Robinson has spoken about the difficulty of writing about goodness. It's hard to write about, and it's also evidently not what the culture expects. We have uh, memoirs of trauma and pathography instead of biography. But you put before us two thoroughly good people, good to each other, good to their children, good to their neighbors, uh, so strongly that, it, that I, I know their goodness through your words. As an artist, have you thought about that, the, the challenge of making them good on the page? Well, I think this is true for most writers, you know the end game is publication, but that's not active in your mind for most of the process, right? So I was writing that book out of an obsessive need to learn something about my parents and also capture something for my kids who would never know them. My, both my parents are gone, my kids are um, I want them to know who we as a family were and who they come from. And so I just wanted to tell stories about them. I didn't really have an investment in building that sense of that they were good people. I just wanted to tell stories about who they you know, had been for me. Um, some of the questions that I had about them, like, what, you know, how how could my father have been so, um, so capable and so willing to you know, make our lives as children easy and happy um, despite what I imagine he must have been feeling at different moments in his life in the world. You know, he joined the, the Air Force when the military was segregated and how I don't know, like how, how did he deal with all of the realities that, that were real for him? Um, those questions came out as a writer. I didn't have those when I was a kid, but they came into the work because I said, you know, in one of those subsequent layers of the story, I said, wait a minute, I mean, what, what else was going on there? And, and what does it mean that it was invisible to me when I was a child? I'm struck by what you said about the memoirs for your children, not exclusively for them, but it's written with them in mind. When you um, engage with your parents in poetry, it seems that it's actually more directly between you and them somehow. And I'm wondering if that has to do with what you said earlier about this sense of, of, an in, um, the, of the analogy, let's say, between literary experience and spiritual experience. There's you seem to be striving almost for a kind of communication, I don't want to sound hokey, with, 
with your, your parents who are dead through, through the poems. Is that what's going on? Or? Well, I remember writing Life on Mars. Um, and that's what I, I mean, I wasn't trying to have Ouija board sessions with my dad. And they had, they had told you specifically. Yeah, don't do that. Um, don't tip any tables. <laughs> don't even go to our graves. Is that it? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I also, I, I woke up each day. I, was, I happened to be on a sabbatical or maternity leave or some, some version of all this stuff. And um, I just woke up and I said, but I still, I just need to think about him. I need to think about him. And a poem allowed me to do that. I didn't know what the poem was going to say. I didn't know what it should say. And the, the elegies in this book, some of them are, are you know, little quick exercises in form because form helped me harness that wish a little bit. Okay, well, you have to say this because it's a guzzle. You have to keep saying this one thing over and over again while you're thinking about him. Um, and the memoir, it was more linear, I guess, right? I would say, I've, okay, I wrote this thing from 1978 and this thing from 1986. What happened in between those years? Well, let me go back and try and logically think about what I remember from you know, this grade or this grade or this you know, time of watching the news at night with my parents. Um, so there, there was often uh, an anchor to the external world that helped me figure out what to dive into. There's a very candid moment, I think it's in your memoir, where you, you say you were writing, maybe it's an interview, you were writing poetry in college, and then uh, your mother took ill or became gravely ill and died, and then you went to graduate school and you had material. <laughs> And in some ways, a lot of the next 15 years was the material of engaging with you know, the awfulness of the death of both parents. And now, um, are, so you're, are you on to something else now? Or is the fact that you've dealt with that so thoroughly, does that create space for you to think about uh, people being mistreated in Louisiana or uh, Gullah culture? Or how did you get to this next step that you're on now? Um, I think it, I don't know. That's probably the answer that's honest. Um, I, I didn't have a lot of poems for a long time because this memoir took about six years to write. So no, not much poetry in that time? Yeah, not much poetry. That We talked about that Smithsonian poem. That was probably one of the first poems that I wrote um, after Life on Mars, and that was simply because I knew it was be... Um, smart to say yes to something that would make me write a poem. Um, and so I just allowed things to sort of get written and, and get put away. And then um, what usually happens for me, I come to a period where I no longer feel like I want to be silent. I no longer feel like it's enough to sort of just receive. I want to start making things. And that, for me, that came alive during my sabbatical last spring. Um, and so what was happening in the world was a lot of what I woke up to in, in language, you know, woke up to. Um, Is there a challenge of being poet laureate at a time when poetry and civility and compassion, needless to say, universal benevolence aren't uh, aren't common coin in Washington? I don't know what it's like to be poet laureate at any other time. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't even quite know what it's like to be that now because it's only been about a month. But I, I have this hope that, you know, poetry is such a, if we let it be, it's such a beautiful practice and a, a humbling in a good way exercise to let language work upon us and to actually listen to language and to think this is a voice that's connected to a life and a person and a body somewhere and I've just spent 15 minutes with it. What would it mean to look at somebody and imagine that same depth is there in them? You know, like what would it mean if 
if I could listen with curiosity to a person in front of me. That seems like good political practice. If we could all listen for 15 minutes, <laughs> then good things would happen. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I can hear from the laughter that there's, there are people in the audience who are, have things to ask and things to say. I want to open it up to them. But first, just to circle back a moment to Seamus Heaney, because uh, Bishop Ty, who's uh, here with us, um, knows a good amount about Irish poetry. So I'd like to invite him to uh, make a connection or two between your work and Heaney's with a question. Yeah, Tracy, I just found that was amazing to listen to. One of the things that I am always amazed by is how you talk about compassion, or you were talking when we had lunch earlier, and that ability you have, which I think is the great artists have, is to make us feel I can identify. As I think of my own parents, I can identify with stories you're telling. And that ability to help us to see, you know, very different backgrounds, very different experiences, and yet to see into, almost into the soul of the other person, to see what's the commonality. And that I think I want to applaud. The Heaney line, that, the stuff that I've, <laughs> I've keyed up a little bit by Paul, I found myself rereading a little bit of Heaney, particularly his stuff on seeing things. Mm -hmm. And he has this lovely idea of claritas. It's one of his poems, is Strophe is kind of titled Claritas, about seeing and seeing beyond and seeing more and seeing almost the invisible he has at times, how the visible is rendered perfectly, and yet the same, he's talking about a carving on a facade of a cathedral, I think in Orvieto, where there's a depiction of a baptism, the waters are pouring down, and he says it's rendered perfectly, but the invisible is even better, it's rendered even more. And I think that capacity of the poets to open up and to give us that little more. And I just want to leave with kind of question, this is pushing it a bit, but you talk there, and I love that, I love you, I love you, I love you. As a theologian, I always want to insist that God's love is gratuitous. It's free, it's given to us. We don't earn it, we don't merit it. But that means it's equally given and free for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And often we begin, I think, and there's a great theologian, we're not really recognized enough, I think, who says, we, most of us grow up with a kind of sense of competition. We have to compete for everything. We have to compete for the attention of our parents. If we're in families with, I'm one of six, so you learn to <laughs> make space for the others as well. But that yet you're no less loved for the others being loved as well. And that, do you think poetry can help at this moment? Be one of the ways in which Pope Francis talks about a culture of encounter, mm -hmm. where we can meet the other person and see the other person and see the good, not see them as threat, not see them as enemy, not see them as something to be frightened of. Do you think poetry, maybe its moment is to, to get that sense of compassion, to help us to see into the lives of others and to see the rawness and the, what's in need of healing? And I think, I love your idea. I think the faith at its best is always going to console. But if it doesn't stir and agitate and trouble, then it's also problematic. So just, if you, the poetry, its capacity, or where you think maybe the question I'm trying to turn this into, can poetry really begin to help us to think more on what unites us? I think so. I mean, I, I will really, really want to believe that it can. Um, I really like what you said about the nature of God's love, which is that it's freely and equally given. It's not a finite. Um, and it just made me think about how the language that we've been thrust into is the opposite of that because it's driven by the principles of an economic market where everything is valuable because it's finite. And the more you have and the more you can exclude others from having, the better off you are. And that language has infused everything in our lives, even our, our view of ourselves. You know, The only reason we want to be liked on this stuff is so that we can have more likes than, you know, it's, it, it's like a, it, poetry, I think, is one way of buying out of that. It's a few like steps, right? But I'm, I'm thinking this, the language of a poem is not, um, it's not rooted in uh, being efficient in that way. And it's not rooted in persuading you towards something that you don't need. And it's not um, even tr 
trusting of, you know, like the kinds of obfuscation and the bait and switch, all of these other, you know, mechanisms of this other, this other mode of, of, of speech. And once you become interested in the other things language can do, I think you become a little bit distrustful of, of what I just named, all of those things, those tropes of the market. Um, and so even if you're not reading a poem, when that comes at you, you feel it as an assault, as the assault that it is. Um, so that's, I think, an added good. I mean, that's a, aside from what you're, you're talking about, with, about of, of love and of compassion and of empathy. But if we have those things, love and compassion and empathy, and we also have what is essentially like a, a BS meter, <laughs> um, <laughs> then we're, re we're in good form, you know, so. Thank you for that. Uh, and I should really say amen to that. <laughs> uh, questions from the audience? Um. Could you read another poem? <laughs> Is it OK? Of course. <laughs> Here are the other books, if you want. Um, okay. The Angels. Two slung themselves across chairs once in my motel room, grizzled in leather biker gear, emissaries for something I needed to see. I was worn down by an awful panic, a wrenching in the gut, contortions. They sat there at the table while I slept. I could sense them with a deck of playing cards between them. To think of how they smelled, what comes to mind is rum and gasoline. And when they spoke, though I couldn't, I dared not look, I glimpsed how one's teeth were ground down almost to nubs, which makes me hope some might be straight up thugs, young, slim, raw, who bounce and roll with fearsome grace, whose very voices cause faint souls to quake. Quake then, fools, and fall away. What God do you imagine we obey? Think of the toil we must cost them, one scaled perfectly to eternity. And still they come, telling us through the ages not to fear. Just those two, that once, and never again for me since. Though there are, are there sightings, flashes, hints. A proud tree in vivid sun, branches swaying in strong wind. Rain hurling itself at the roof. Boulders, mounds of earth mistaken for dead does, lions in crouch a rust-stained pipe where a house once stood, which I take each time I pass it for an owl. Bright whirl, so dangerous and near. My mother sat whispering with it at the end of her life, while all the rooms of our house filled up with night. You mentioned that you have children and, of course, how much your um, own mother and uh, father meant to you. Um, I know myself that as I became a mother and, and things happened, I often had the feeling that, oh, this is what it was like for my mother. And I'm wondering if you have had some of that and if any of that works its way into your poetry. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, th I haven't written a lot of poems about my children, but I have a couple. Um, and I have that moment every day, you know, and it's, it's often, it's like, oh, I, I, 
I must have been this little beautiful thing. But it's also often like, oh God, I put her through real hell sometimes, you know? Um, seeing my daughter do, or understanding she's thinking what I must have once thought to. Um, I think it's amazing. I think it's such a gift to be able to be so humbled, <laughs> really. Like when you, when you have kids, it is not ever, ever, ever again about you. At least that's where I am right now in my child rearing. It's like, I'm over now. <laughs> um, and I think that's great. We, I think that's a great place to be. I think we would all like to thank you very, very much for having accepted the responsibilities of uh, Port Laureate. I can only imagine as a writer how disruptive and distracting it is and to be taken away from your creative activities. Um, this question has been posed twice and maybe I'll, I'm going to pose it a third time in a different way. But our nation is experiencing, is going through a very challenging time. Uh, the enormous risks um, and once again our nation's history is being exposed but in, in real time, who we are and, and what the fabric of being an American is. And some of that's not very attractive. As Port Laureate, as the national ambassador for poetry uh, in our country, do you feel any personal responsibility, uh, obligation or duties to help us navigate this period to help us understand better who we are through a lens of compassion and love that, that a lot of your work has pivoted around. Um, and this could be through your writing, it could be through your representation, it could be through your teaching. But uh, do you see opportunities and do you see a responsibility at this time in that direction? Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, I. I think what's really interesting will, for me is to think about how those strong convictions that have to do with principle and feeling can live in a conversation about language, which is what I've been asked to foster. And so I think there's a way to do that. I mean, you, my beliefs about poetry are you know, what I've been talking about. This is something that can help us to stop avoiding the hard, and indicting facts of who we are. This is something that tells us you have to talk, but you also have to stop and listen and struggle with what you hear. Um, and, you know, honesty rather than elaborate obfuscation is, you know, the, the currency of a poem. And I think those things mean the same exact thing when you take the poem away and you talk about human interactions. I'm talking about poems in this position, but I think it's a useful set of um, principles that relate also to other contexts. Tracy, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to um, recess and go to the reception outside. Uh, there are books for you to sign. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Thank you, President DeJoya. Thank you again, Bishop Tai. And thank you, Tracy K. Smith. Oh, thank you.